Hi, everybody. Um, so we're just waiting for uh, people who registered for the course to join. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of emails went to the spam or junk folder. So if you know anybody who signed up for the course uh, but didn't receive the link, um, uh, maybe you can tell them to check the junk folder. Or they can also go to our YouTube channel where it's being live streamed. It's um, SOAS X N S S R, and they can also watch it live stream there. So we're gonna wait for a couple more minutes until like more people join, and then we'll get going uh, very soon. Uh, Paolo Dos Santos wrote that he's getting an invalid link to join. So I guess maybe he hasn't registered. Um, okay, just give me a second. I'm going to um, do something. If you put it maybe here on chat, I can send it. So yeah, the link on the original flyer wouldn't work because we weren't expecting this many people. So we had to move it to a webinar format, hence why the original link on the flyer doesn't work. So, but they must have gotten an email and I, as long okay. as they check the junk folder. For those who have not registered though, and we're thinking about just joining the link, if you send me the link, I will email the group just in case. Lake is in the chat and I'm about to send another email. I'm gonna Okay, so with this link, anyone can enter, correct? They can enter directly on the, right. Maybe we can send this to Econ Group in case. Yeah, that's what I, I just did that. Uh, I just did that right now. See if you got it. And thank you so much to the attendees for being patient. We're just trying to figure out the logistics. Um, we had a great number of people registered. Um, 2,500 people, and this happened over the course of the, just the past couple of days. So we had to completely switch formats, um, which we're excited about because this means wider outreach, um, but just a little bit of uh, logistical uh, bumps at the beginning. So just bear with us for a few more minutes. Thanks. Yes, 12.10, so in three minutes, we will begin. We're giving people just three more minutes. Um, can I just say, I think the YouTube link that was shared 
uh, is not connected to this one. So I think people have to go to the YouTube channel and then, and then find a live stream video. How do we deal with that? Um, let me think about it. The YouTube link is in the chat, um, Wani, if you need it. Michael just put it in. Yeah, I think uh, what I'm saying is that the, pro, uh, the email that we sent out to people who registered, when you click the YouTube link there, that's a different to what is being live streamed. Can, is it possible um, to send out another email? Um, yeah, the I correct think, link uh, or Zoom webinar. And the correct link is in the chat right now. Mike and just sent it. So no school, just sent it. Sorry, the new email you want me to send to the um, usual econ group, or I took care of the the people on our side with I the. Think, so yeah, that's I fine. think it's people in the new school. I think are okay. Silvina is also saying that uh, the YouTube is waiting for us to start, but that's normal. I'm also getting I'm also getting messages saying people cannot connect. We are live streaming on YouTube. I just checked and we are there. Yes, YouTube is working. And if Costas, if you get an, uh, messages from people um, asking to join. Yeah. Um, Clara, would you send this link to Costas on WhatsApp or something so he can share it um, with or, or by email? They're the same link that you just circulated on our email. On the newspaper. Okay, I, I sent it to Costas, yes. Costas has it. So the webinar is getting more and more populated and I think we should start anyway. It's a good thing that this um, series will be recorded, live streamed and recorded. So people can watch it later on. I mean, we are definitely, um, we were hoping that more people can join us here, um, but we already have near 250 people, which is great. And more people will join as they figure out um, the logistics and, and which, which um, links to use. While I would have preferred that we started on a cleaner note, I am also um, kind of happy that this happened because we are anyway trying to come out of the way that things are done in the mainstream and be more honest and transparent, which is, you know, the, the motto behind this whole project. And as you will see um, what we mean by that as we move on. So having said that, let me get started. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. My name is Hanin Khawaja. I'm a PhD student um, here at the New School. And hi, everyone. My name is Hwani Bey, and I'm a student organizer from SOAS as well. Yeah. So as I mentioned, we had almost 2,500 people register for this series, and that is why we had to move from a regular Zoom to a webinar and open it um, to YouTube for some just restrictions on numbers from all these, from all these platforms. So if you know anyone that's registered and didn't receive an email, this is probably because the email went to their junk or their spam. So please tell them to, to, check, it, um, to check it there. So before we start and before um, we give the floor to Professor Kostas Lapavitsas, let me just give you um, a brief uh, about how this idea started. So last year, last academic year, Professor Lepovitsas was a visiting scholar here at the New School. 
And the idea of this project began from a series of conversations that we uh, were having with him and with students and with other um, faculty at, at the economics department. So as an, in, we, we were thinking that we need an, to establish an, an initiative to establish a global network where we can discuss heterodox and alternative economic ideas and tools. Um, and what we want to do is to develop a theoretical understanding of capitalism, especially from a Marxist political economy perspective, and establish a framework that we can then use um, and which will include a tool set that will help us design um, alternative ways of dealing with our current issues and be an, uh, an effective opposition to um, the, the state of the current economic system and to capitalism. So to, to, to make sure that this is a wide reaching and a broad um, uh, and, and inclusive uh, project, we plan to bring in real life issues through student discussions, which will start from next week's lecture. As you saw in the email and the material that was circulated, each lecture will have one hour of theory by um, a faculty member, and then PhD students will lead a 30 minute um, discussion that will tackle real um, life uh, policy issues. And those students will be from both the new school um, and, and SOAS, and they will be discussing um, you know, relevant current issues. So um, this lecture series is primarily designed for postgraduate level and above. Um, however, we welcome and encourage uh, all the activists, unionists, and really just anybody who is interested in alternative politics to join in. And I think, uh, as we mentioned many times, like the fact that like over 2,500 people have registered for this course really shows that um, the state of the current situation, um, the, the level of aspiration and how desperate we all are for a systemic change. So um, yeah, as we mentioned, this has been a way beyond our expectation. And um, we are kicking off this project with this lecture series um, this year, which was designed from scratch by um, the PhD students from both institutions and as well as, as uh, faculty members. And we want to make it even bigger next year onwards. Um, involving more people from various institutions and organizations, not just from the UK and the US, but globally. And all the lectures will be recorded, so, and they will be uploaded on YouTube. And um, uh, so yeah, please make sure you subscribe to the channel and share it on your social media. Um, and we're also creating a website um, for this project and uh, working on uh, making a social media account as well. So the student discussion section, uh, which uh, will start from next week, will also be made into a podcast series. Um, so that's the purpose is to reach an even wider audience. So we're, we're just really excited to like grow this project together with you. Like we don't want it, we don't want you to just just watch it and uh, walk away from it. We actually want you to be part of it. So please make sure like you send us your ideas and thoughts how we can grow this global network of heterodox economics to our email sape at newschool.edu. Excellent. So now we don't wanna keep you um, waiting more, just minor housekeeping. For any questions, please use the chat box that you see at the bottom of your screen to send in your questions. We already have 250 people here and we have a good number of people on YouTube. So we will do our best to answer the questions. So just bear with us. And for today's lecture, uh, we have uh, Professor Kostas Lababitsas from SOAS, who wrote numerous books, including um, The Left Case Against the EU and Profiting Without Producing, How Finance Exploits Us All, amongst many, many more. He also was a member of the, bar the parliament in Greece. Um, with um, Syriza party. He also um, actively engages in the UK working class struggle by supporting the union, including RMT. Professor Lapavitsas, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I hope this works. Um, this is a uh, very important uh, 
um, effort being made here. And I hope that it brings the best results possible. Uh, I don't want to repeat what has been heard so far. Uh, all I want to say is that it's, it's been a long time coming. Um, some kind of um, steady connection uh, in the, up, across the, uh, the Atlantic in the first instance between institutions that work on political economy and then on this basis, broadening out, reaching out to others across the world so that we can begin to develop uh, some real discussion about uh, political economy and in particular Marxist political economy uh, and the current conditions. There is a very strong um, demand for this um, uh, at the moment. Um, the people who are coming into this, are, uh, as you can see from the list, um, uh, very prominent in their work uh, in political economy. And uh, um, one of them is attending, Duncan Foley is attending in the, uh, in the uh, uh, room at the moment. So D Duncan will be delivering some of the work later on, but there will be others, um, distinguished people who ought to develop the discussion of Marxist economics uh, and Marxist political economy um, through, this, uh, uh, through this series. Anyway, enough of this. I'll get on with the topic. When I was asked to, to talk about why political economy, what is political economy today, I must admit, I didn't know how to handle it. I was in two minds. It's not an easy topic to handle because uh, what do you say first? How do you go about it? Um, what makes it specific? And in particular, um, what makes Marxist political economy specific and different? I thought then that the best way to do it in the Marxist tradition is to start with something concrete. Start with something concrete and then return to it. Um, and what concrete instance can one select from what's happening at the moment in order to begin to uh, discuss what might be Marxist political economy for the present time? Well, I'll give you an instance. A few months ago, the United States decided to freeze the dollar reserves of Russia. Um, that's not the first time the United States has done that. It, for instance, not so long ago, froze the dollar reserves of Afghanistan. And it's done it in the past too. That's one instance of a strategic um, deployment of the dollar by the US um, government and by the US ruling bloc. But it's not the only instance. It's a very prominent and egregious instance, but it's not the only instance. Um, we know, for instance, that the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States, has also used dollar swap facilities with other central banks strategically uh, in the crisis of 2007-2009, uh, as well as in the shock, the pandemic shock of 2020. It selected which um, central banks it would cooperate with, and um, it made um, dollar reserve, dollar swap uh, facilities available to them, or it did not. Now, that again is a strategic use uh, of the dollar by the US uh, ruling bloc, and a very important act of policy. How to approach it? How to analyze it? What to think of it? What to make of it? Now, one could approach it as political theory. Obviously, one could approach it as political theory uh, and examine it in terms of the political um, priorities, the political choices, uh, the political pressures on the US government and the broader uh, US uh, ruling bloc. One can do that and examine it by look, going over committee meetings, evidence, archives, whatever it is that would allow to give an answer in terms of political theory. If you engage in that, it very quickly though becomes uh, obvious that um, that's not enough. And it's not enough because you also have to answer um, 
why is it that the elites make these uh, choices? Why is it that the US ruling bloc made these choices? Uh, what is the material substratum explaining these choices beyond the immediate or longer term political calculation? You've got to say that. Otherwise, you can't explain how and why foreign exchange reserves would be used strategically. Now, you can bring in some economics after doing um, political analysis. You can bring in uh, some economics. Indeed, that's what, indeed, that's what um, uh, people do. And then you get what is called international political economy. Um, and uh, basically, um, you supplement and enrich the political analysis with some analysis of broad economic movements, uh, economic policy considerations, uh, and so on. But then again, further thought will also tell you that this is not enough. This is not enough because such an approach would never explain the organic link between economic interest and political power. It, they might coincide, one might affect the other, but they won't, it won't tell you what is the organic connection between the two. It won't um, reveal that. It, in a sense, economics comes into it um, from the outside, as it were. You begin with political theory and you bring economics in from the outside. So that's not good, that's not enough. You can also begin to explain the actions of the US government with regard to the dollar by doing just economics. You can look at the cost of reserves. You can look at the advantages provided by holding reserves. You can look at the liquidity provision. You can look at competing currencies. You can analyze the position of the dollar in relation to other currencies and so on. But then by analogy with the previous example of political theory, it will soon become clear that that's, that's not enough. That's not enough because um, apart from everything else, what would lead the United States ruling bloc to make a decision with regard to the strategic use of the dollar that might have negative implications for it? Um, what would uh, account for that purely in terms of economics? Not very much. Now, you can bring politics into it then, starting from the economics, but then that would be to repeat what international political economy has done, except that you're doing, you're doing it by starting from economics. You're, you're actually importing politics into it because you can't explain certain things by analyzing the um, economic process. Neither would work. That's a very important topic that needs explaining. Neither would work satisfactorily at any rate. You might come up with some explanations, in my judgment, nothing would, neither would work satisfactorily. Political economy, particularly Marxist political economy, is about developing analyses and explanations that would integrate the two, uh, that would do so from the beginning. Um, and more than that, that would bring in the social and the customary and other the historical uh, element uh, in play. And that's what would make it different. That's what would make it specific, make it um, an approach um, for the here and now. The real question, of course, is how to do it. So let me tell you a few um, uh, theoretical and analytical points, and let, then let me return to the issue after um, the theoretical uh, excursus, essentially. How to do it then? how to approach the question in a way that organically links um, the economic with the political and then the social and the customary and so on. Now, it will be no surprise to this uh, audience if I said that the starting point in how to do it cannot be other than classical political economy. Now, I promise you I'm not gonna go over the history of economic thought here, but it's impossible to do it without, um, without um, mentioning a few ele elements of um, where it all comes from, okay? Which are very, very important. So classical political economy is the starting point. It must be the starting point in two cru crucial ways from my perspective. The first, uh, classical political economy emerged in opposition to mercantilism, right? Mercantilism being the dominant economic um, theory uh, for a long time preceding a classical political economy. And, uh, um, what basically classical political economy did in opposition to mercantilism, which matters for us, is to 
begin to explain the functioning of a capitalist market economy um, as a self-motivated entity. Um, an entity that basically um, uh, functioned through its own internal dynamic and uh, continue to function that way successfully, continue to survive in that way. When you read Adam Smith's great book, when you, when you close the final page, when you go over the final page, um, what you get is a, a sense of an analysis of a system that basically works by itself and propagates itself. That is a very, very big difference from the mercantilists, and that's what um, classical political economy bequeathed us, an approach that says we must analyze capitalism as something that can, um, that can support itself by itself. It doesn't need the state to make it work, in other words, although the state is crucial, as I will explain in a minute. Um, the second thing that is also very important for us here is that, of course, opposition, opposition to mercantilism was not enough. What was also needed for classical political economy was the legacy of, of physiocracy. The legacy of physiocracy, which you will find in Smith, matters here by, by, fundamentally for a very similar point to what I mentioned before, the idea of reproduction. Reproduction being a term that describes a process through which a complex economic entity reproduces itself by itself and possibly expands. Now that's a very important idea for political economy and it immediately creates a contrast with contemporary econ economics, classical economics, which doesn't really use reproduction, it uses equilibrium, the idea of equilibrium. Um, that's not to say that political economy does not use the idea of equilibrium, but reproduction is more fundamental um, for uh, political economy. And that comes from, from the legacy ultimately of the physiocrats, particularly for Marxist political economy. Now, I could say more here, but I won't because I'm short and that's not really the issue. The issue is not the historical origins. Uh, the issue is simply what are we rooted in? And from classical political economy, I would say for today, for Marxist political economy today, what we take is uh, the following points. First of all, capitalism is a dynamic system in constant flux that reproduces itself. Accumulation is its driving principle. What makes it tick is accumulation, that is its driving principle. And what determines accumulation and ultimately the distribution of the product is of course class. The classical political economists were very clear about class. They talked about class openly. And the pivotal concepts here in analyzing both accumulation and distribution ultimately of the product is of course value and labor as uh, reference ideas. Classical political economy was able to do all that. This is a great achievement, which is a foundation for what we do today. Uh, do all that and uh, more, um, of course, because it operated within and reflected the functioning of advancing industrial capitalism. Um, first half of the uh, 19th century is the era in which industrial capitalism began, became the dominant uh, form of social organization in uh, key countries of Western Europe. And from there, gradually, it began to establish a world market uh, and it began to establish a global capitalist system, the system that uh, we live in today. The classical political economy is basically uh, a product of that uh, period. What happened subsequently is also a product of how capitalism developed. Because as we know, classical political economy came to an end in the 1860s, 1870s. What emerged was neoclassical economics, which is 100 years later, 150 years later, is the dominant form of economics, of course, by far, um, which did not recognize class any longer, did not recognize any historical correspondence with what was happening around it particularly, and it relied on individualism and used different tools, some of which I will mention as we move along, to draw economic conclusions uh, in that particular way. Uh, what also followed classical political economy was German historicism, the German historical school, which doesn't exist anymore fundamentally. The last exponent was probably Weber, although that's stretching it. Um, but um, what made them different was that they decried all theory. When you looked at society, they decried all theory. And that was a fundamental weakness um, 
for our purposes. The last, um, the last uh, current that emerged was, of course, Marxism, Marxist political economy, which is different from classical political economy, but in some important ways, it can be considered the true heir of, um, of classical political economy. It's a break, but also um, in important ways, a continuation more important, uh, in more important ways than neoclassicism can be said to come out, to have come out of uh, classical political economy. In this framework, then, how to sum up Marxist political economy? What is it? How to approach it? I'll give you my take. And that's not a full take because I could have spoken this for a long time. I'll give you points that I think are vital for understanding it um, and important for explaining the conundrum I began with, which is how to approach the question of how the United States um, uses the dollar strategically in the political economy way, how to analyze that. Um, the first point I want to stress is that Marxist political economy is a conceptual and analytical rigor, which is not often appreciated, not only by neoclassical economists, but also by those who profess it or those who wish to do it. Um, this uh, conceptual and analytical rigor has got very deep roots and it's not obvious immediately. People think um, that they can say what they like when it comes to these things. And people often confuse mathematical rigor with conceptual and analytical rigor. Uh, mathematics is very important, obviously, but analytical and conceptual rigor is a different thing. And uh, Marxist political economy, um, and he, the theoretical approach has got, as I said before, conceptual and analytical rigor. Now, a number of points on this. I say I could have spoken for a long time, right? but I will make just three points to indicate how this uh, what, what drives this rigor. The first is that for Marxist political economy, labor is the defining condition, not simply of economy, but of humanity generally. It's a deep philosophical point it's, uh, that uh, Marx and others make. Uh, labor is what distinguishes human beings from other animals in nature. It's what makes us uh, what, we are, what we are. And it's what, it's what makes us what we are, not only in terms of um, interacting with nature, but also creating ourselves in terms of consciousness. Labor is the distinguishing feature of human beings. It's what gives them consciousness, is what creates them as thinking beings um, uh, as well. Labor then is, uh, is the pivotal point, it's the benchmark, it's the it's the, the, the ultimate foundation of this, uh, uh, this kind of approach to economy. And therefore, ultimately that gives value and value as a, a concept through which we can begin to think about capitalism systematically. It's the form in which labor appears um, in a capitalist um, economy. Now, <laughs> labor is also the materialist underpinning of society. Um, and it gives us an ordering uh, of relations through which to think about economy uh, and society. Production is the original process. Production is the original process because that's where the core of labor um, takes place. Now, there are many types of labor. I don't want to go into that. Productive labor, unproductive labor. These are very interesting uh, and important ideas, but they're not of the moment. Suffice it to say that that's the materialist underpinning of society and the original activity that uh, or the basis of which we can uh, uh, analyze social phenomena. People create their societies uh, based on labor, but of course they do so historically. They do so through um, history. They don't do so mechanically or automatically. In other words, there is no crude materialism in the approach of Marxist political economy. Uh, crude materialism, in, in fact, you can find in the approach of neoclassical economics very often. You read papers by neoclassical economists and others um, wishing to explain development, um, the evolution of societies, and you, what you come across is the crudest of materialism at times. Societies are what they are because some places produce wheat, other places produce rice, some places have got rivers, other places have got mountains. Some places are flat, other, some places are warm, some places are cold. This is the crudest materialism imaginable. Um, 
that's not enough, and that's not Marxist political economy. Labor is the materialist foundation. Labor takes place, however, historically in a given uh, material, physical uh, context. Um, in, that, in that respect, even geography um, is a dynamic entity. Uh, people create their natural environment um, through their interaction with nature and through relations with each other. So the materialism that we find through, through labor in analyzing society is uh, a sophisticated and sensitive materialism. It's dialectical materialism, to give it its appropriate name. It's never crude materialism. So labor and a materialist understanding of how society um, uh, comes about and is created by human beings who, who also create themselves in the process. Um, for capitalism specifically now, because there are many types of society created in that way historically, for capitalism in particular now, two conditions are paramount uh, for Marxist political economies, two, two, conditions, two social conditions are paramount. The first is that labor must take form primarily um, it must take place primarily through the form of wage labor. It must be wage labor. Um, Marx established that uh, fundamental idea. Uh, and that means essentially labor that is free from the means of production and free to sell itself, okay? free to enter a, a labor market. I don't think that this definition can be improved. To be honest, I think it's perfectly adequate for analyzing capitalism today. That's the first, first condition for understanding capitalism from a political economy, Marx political economy perspective. The second condition is, of course, that uh, um, there are independent and autonomous owners of the means of production um, who have absolute uh, chattel property over uh, the output. They can use it as they wish, it's their own uh, absolute property. Uh, and these producers, call them that, capitalists, essentially interact through markets. Fundamentally, they interact, interact through markets uh, with one another. Um, in other words, what we, what we use to define capitalism is, of course, class. Class, and we take that from political economy, right? Fundamentally, the capitalist class and the um, uh, wage labor class, but also accumulation. That again, we take that, that again, we take from classical political economy, accumulation being the, um, the driving motive of these independent and autonomous producers as they interact and compete uh, with each other. Now, the point is here to connect it to what I said previously about sensitive materialism and sophisticated materialism, that this takes place uh, in a definite, within a definite framework. This doesn't, place, doesn't take place detached from other conditions or on some planet away from Earth and away from other, uh, from, from other situations and things that matter. It takes place within a definite framework of laws, of customs, of institutions, of conventions, uh, and so on. In other words, accumulation takes place through these two fundamental conditions, but within a channel. That term belongs to Leon Trotsky. Um, he came up with it in discussion of crises a um, long time ago. Um, and I can't think of a more appropriate term to describe how accumulation moves. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a stream that moves within a channel. Uh, the stream is... Um, is, is determined by wage labor and capitalists engaging in competition, but it takes place within a, within a channel uh, set by broader conditions, broader considerations, some of which are non-economic, um, quite clearly uh, non-economic. The most important element in that channel is, of course, the state. The state, then, uh, is the other factor which political economists necessarily uh, take into um, account uh, in this connection, and the state has a two-way relationship uh, with accumulation, the channel affects the flow and the flow affects the channel. I could have said more on this, but again, time is short. I've got to move on. Um, now, given these broad considerations, considerations, how to structure the analysis, how to proceed and do rigorous Marxist political economy, given these um, priors or given these uh, conditions which are fundamental to understanding how to uh, approach questions of um, social and economic importance. Rigor is what matters here, uh, but rigor, as I already indicated, must be conceptual, not necessarily mathematical. Mathematics can come into it, of course, and it simplifies and improves things at times. 
but rigor must be conceptual in the first place. Um, specifically, what is demanded here is a clear understanding of how to order and sequence the concepts. And Marxism is very demanding in this respect. You can't do what you like. Uh, there, is a, there, is a, there is a definite way of uh, proceeding in this respect. And it's a way that comes from Marx's philosophical training, which obviously leads to, to Hegel, but I hasten to add, it also leads to Aristotle, because Marx was influenced by Aristotle far more than people usually allow for. Um, so uh, the sequence of concepts and the way in which you pursue concepts is what gives rigor to the uh, analysis. And very simply put, the concepts must go from simple to more complex concepts as you, as you come down the uh, levels of analysis. The highest level of analysis would have simple concepts. Lower levels of analysis would have more complex concepts. And you develop and enrich the concepts as you, as you traverse uh, the levels of analysis from the highest uh, to the lowest level. And as you drop the levels of analysis uh, from high to low, you approach your approach more closely uh, observes um, realities. The assumption made here, and it's a Hegelian assumption, is that the simple in a way contains the complex, uh, that the complex doesn't arise arbitrarily out of the simple. The simple would give birth to the complex concept, and it would do so um, in a way that can be revealed by discussing contradictions within the simple concept. That's not an easy process to do. People talk often about contradictions when they do Marxist economics without specifying the contradiction. Um, so it takes training and it takes, um, it, it takes practice. One last thing, uh, which is of paramount importance, um, and that is, of course, that if one follows Marx in doing that, then the, the, the traverse of the concepts from simpler to, concept, to, to complex concepts and the traverse of the, level of the levels of analysis from higher to lower as you pursue the work um, must also be constantly enriched by reference to empirical reality. This isn't simply, simply an exercise in the, in, the, in the idea, the Geist unfolding itself. That's pure Hegelianism. That's never the case with Marx and Marxist political economy. At every level, as you, uh, as you proceed in analyzing the real, in other words, the concrete and, 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 and empirically observed reality must, must be interjected and appear strategically in allowing you to traverse uh, the logical sequence. Uh, you, they, you must incorporate the empirical along the way. Uh, and as, uh, as you go from high to low levels of abstraction, as you increase um, complexity. Uh, Marxist political economy cannot be done abstractly. There is no such thing. It must be done in conjunction with the empirical uh, and the real at all times. No one has explained that more clearly uh, in my uh, uh, readings and experience than Roman Rozolsky. Uh, who wrote a classic book on how Marx produced the Grundrisse. Um, he wrote that book a long time ago, Rosdowski did, back in the day when knowledge of Marxism was far more widespread and deep than it is at the moment. Now let me be a little more specific, if we're going to do that, in a way that would allow me to discuss the question I set myself. How are we going to do this in practice? Very simply put, and jumping through a number of different uh, difficult points, ju jumping over a number of difficult points. Economic analysis of capitalism must commence and must return at all times to the circuit of industrial capital. Um, the circuit of industrial capital is an intellectual breakthrough made by Karl Marx. Keynes realized that. Keynes hadn't read Marx particularly even until very late, but then Keynes read very, a lot of things very late. Um, but one of the things that he took from Marx, he didn't, have a very, well, he didn't have a very high opinion of Marx's work, but one of the things that he took from Marx was that the circuit of industrial capital is an intellectual breakthrough. Um, 
the circuit of industrial capital is very simply put, uh, the, the basic analytical description of how capital moves, starts as money, becomes commodities, enters production, produces new commodities, and then it becomes more money, which is of course money profit added to the initial money investment. Um, two points arise immediately when you start economics in that way. The circuit clearly separates the market, the field of the market from the field of the non-market. It separates the market from the non-market immediately. It, 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 it is part of the circuit itself to, to separate. Them. So uh, from M to C, from money to commodities, and from commodities to money, we've got the market, two different aspects of it, but the market. Uh, when capital enters production and we get, we leave the market and other things takes place, take place in the factory or at the workplace uh, generally. That's the first point. The second thing that the circuit does, the formulation of the circuit does for our purposes, it, it allows for a sophisticated discussion of the difference between the economic and the non-economic. Not the market and the non-market, but the economic and the non-economic. Both of these issues are of great significance and problematic for most economic theory. So if you look at the process of production alone within the circuit, the process of production contains economic relations, which are of course non-market, economic relations which are based on authority, uh, diktat, um, engineering, uh, fiat by those who manage the production uh, process. That immediately gives you an aspect of power. There is no dimension of production without power and therefore without oppression. The relation between capital and labor in production is not a relation of market equals. It's a relation which contains power and hierarchy immediately. So we separate the market from the non-market, but we also bring in the economic and the non-economic in a sophisticated way immediately. We don't have to do it um, after the event, as it were. We don't have to import the non-economic uh, from the window, as it were. But similar considerations hold for the, for the market, for commodities to money or money to commodities aspect of the circuit, because of course, um, they contain um, relations which are based on custom, which are based on uh, regular practice, which are based, which are based on uh, state intervention, which are based on institutions which established um, extraneously. And that also allows for a sophisticated discussion from the very beginning of the economic uh, and the non-economic. So to repeat, capitalist accumulation moves in a channel, within a channel, um, but contains complex social and non-economic relations within its core areas, within the market area and the non-market area. There is no Chinese wall, in other words, for Marxist political economy between the economic and the non-economic and between the market and the non-market. We separate and divide them analytically. We do that from the very beginning of uh, our analytical process, but we never separate them through a Chinese wall. We know by the structure of the analysis that they are connected and integrally connected. But at the same time, there is an order of significance. We assume that there's an order of significance. Production is uh, primary. And it's pi primary because it goes back to labor. Labor is a distinguishing feature of humanity. That's what makes us different. Production is um, uh, what um, drives uh, the rest. Uh, in this context, um, other aspects, non-economic aspects, emerge actively at all levels. First of all, the states. Um, and the states, um, its actions and so on. Uh, and history also uh, emerge uh, continuous, co continuously and at all levels. Um, it is for research, actual research, um, to uh, incorporate those um, sensitively. By doing so, of course, it can begin to discuss the transformations of capitalism. It can begin to periodize capitalism. It can begin to... Um, uh, give uh, interesting, uh, relevant uh, dimensions of how capitalism has moved uh, 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 over, the, over the decades and the centuries. I don't want to imply that somehow this is all uh, perfect and uh, everything is marvelous and straightforward, far from it. If you engage in this kind of analytics, in this kind of um, political economy, 
then uh, there is a particularly thorny problem that you will face very, uh, very rapidly. And that thorny problem is the following. What is prior analytically and what is prior historically? Which forms emerge through the analysis of simple concepts and therefore the creation of more complex concepts? Which forms emerge through this uh, logical analysis and which forms do we observe in history that correspond with the uh, logical forms that we derive through analysis? And how does it work? The problems that arise in that context legion. And they arise, uh, they're the, the legion because in history, we often observe very complex phenomena, economically complex phenomena emerging very early in human history, long before capitalism became the dominant mode of production. We observe forms of capitalistic trading, capitalistic engagement, capitalistic actions uh, and interactions uh, in economy, which, uh, which are very sophisticated and they don't belong to a capitalist economy. They belong to economies which are fundamentally pre-capitalist or non-capitalist. So marrying that and avoiding logical contradiction is never an easy process, never. Uh, it is something that Marxist political economy should always guard against um, and, uh, and be um, careful and sophisticated about it. Now, enough said on this. I will now go back to the question I set myself, uh, given what I've said about the merits of the Marxist political economy. How then, bearing all this in mind, should we analyze uh, the decision by the United States ruling bloc strategically to deploy the dollar? Where does one start in analyzing that? How to, how to understand that? Well, I'll tell you how I would approach it. You've got to go back in the manner that I outlined to simple concepts and a very high level of abstraction. And that is basically that commodities make money. Money is created by commodities. Money is an, is, is, is an offshoot of commodity uh, interactions. Money is the universal equivalent and it's the independent form of value. What follows from that, more complex idea that follows from that, is that money coordinates the domestic market. Money is the organizer of the domestic market. It is the signal and the means for organizing the flows of resources um, across uh, a market economy. Um, and that is a fundamental social function of money since it is the, um, since it's created by commodities. Now, if money is the organizer in this way, then we can logically say that the state intervenes and gives its imprimatur to domestic money. Uh, the state is an entity which is not economic by construction, but if money acts as the uh, organizer of the domestic uh, market and therefore the domestic economy, the state has uh, prima facie um, an interest in intervening and giving its imprimatur to uh, domestic money and transforming it into the standard of price uh, and, uh, and improving its acceptability as means of payment um, as means of, and means of holding. It follows logically. What also follows logically is that the state can manage domestic money um, and it can do so in a variety of ways, not least by lifting the convertibility of domestic money into some money commodity, into gold, to be specific about it. Um, the state can then begin to manage domestic money if it lifts its convertibility to gold. Uh, the state can also manage domestic money if it is convertible to gold, but if it lifts convertibility, it can manage it far more. And it can manage it by controlling the central bank. In a sense, the state can control domestic money by um, transforming the central bank into an arm of the state and controlling the creation of domestic money through um, the central bank. All that can be 
logically demonstrated in the way that I've sketched, uh, leading from simple concepts to more complex concepts. And as we traverse analysis from um, a high level of abstraction to a lower level of abstraction. A crucial point, however, here is that the domestic market differs qualitatively from the world market. Um, it's a crucial point for Marx's political economy. The world market is a different beast compared to the domestic market. No one coordinates the, the, the world market. Um, there is no money equivalent uh, as a coordinate. There is no co there is no equivalent to domestic money in the world uh, market. What happens in the world market is that. Capitalist enterprises compete together with states. States also uh, enter the um, world market and operate. And states and enterprises have got very different motives in, in operating. States are not profit maximizers. Enterprises are. States do not accumulate. Enterprises do. Um, so the world market functions qualitatively in qualitatively different ways to the domestic market. And it is essentially within it, it retains an element of anarchy. It is fundamentally anarchic. Um, the point of reference for world money in this respect, for, for the world market in this respect, is world money. There is world money, but it doesn't function like domestic money. Um, it is a unit of account for key markets, such as the oil market today. Uh, it is the means of payment, and it is the means of hoarding among disparate, different participants in the world market who are fundamentally alien from each other, including different, um, different, states, different states. If you approach it in this way, then the next thing that arises is the following. Competition among states, occurring through the world market as well, inevitably involves elements of hegemony. States compete with, with each other uh, about um, in relations of power um, and hegemony and the ability to hegemonize uh, other states rests on uh, economy, of course, rests on economy and rests on military predominance as well. Um, it's in this context that states participating in the world market can, be used, can, can begin to deploy power over world money in order to facilitate hegemony. The world market, in other words, and the world money that it uses, once you approach it in this way, intrinsically and inherently contains elements of power and elements of hegemony uh, and competition between and among states. The state, the hegemon, the hegemonic state, does not necessarily control world money, but certainly attempts to manage it. The result is a hierarchy, a hierarchy of currencies, always present in the world market, um, because other states will also use their own currencies, but there's a hierarchy, uh, and uh, the, hier the, the, the currency of the hegemon will be at the top of the hierarchy um, within, within that uh, situation. What we've known in the 20th century is that states then proceeded to detach world money from commodities, from gold, through arbitrary action. They stopped it. They stopped the connection between world money and gold through arbitrary action and began to manage it themselves, to, um, to, to, to manage it themselves for reasons of hegemony. The hegemon, ultimately, the United States, was able to um, translate its own domestic money into a quasi-world money. It became able to use its own domestic money as a form of world money that other countries uh, would, for one reason or another, uh, be obliged to use states as well as uh, private capitals, private enterprises taking part. It's in this sense then that world money in the 20th century and now became openly and obviously a weapon of imperial power. Um, it is also a form of tribute paid by peripheral capitals to um, hegemon, uh, and it's an instrument of dependence by developing countries, peripheral countries, uh, on core countries, fundamentally uh, hegemon. The actions of the United States government, seen from this perspective um, in the last few years, are not surprising. The US hegemony depends on the dollar, 
and the US ruling bloc consciously sets out to deploy the dollar in a strategic way uh, to sustain its hegemonic position in the world market and in the world economy more generally. That, I hasten to add, and that's the last thing I will say on this, doesn't mean that it acts rationally at all times. Its actions must be analyzed separately and independently, and that requires richer theory and richer, richer approaches uh, at all times. But the basic uh, framework is laid out by Marxist political economy uh, adequately, uh, in my judgment, and allows for a for a, an organic interplay between uh, the economic uh, and the non-economic, bringing in the political, uh, the social, uh, and the historical. The last thing I want to say, and I know it's time, um, is this. If we approach then Marxist political economy in this way, if we think that this is an important uh, uh, theoretical, analytical uh, approach that, um, uh, that we need and we need to uh, develop and pursue, and I really believe in that. Um, how do we deal with um, the absolute dominance of neoclassicism? And how do we make more use of Marxism as an instrument uh, of political intervention? Now, on neoclassicism, which is absolutely dominant, I want to say the following. Neoclassicism can definitely analyze. There's no use rejecting it as uh, out of hand, as, which is what a lot of Marxists do. Uh, neoclassicism can definitely analyze. Uh, it must be commanded and comprehended uh, in order to pursue analysis. Um, its uh, evolution reflects the further development of, um, um, of um, uh, capitalism, financialization of the last few decades, um, uh, the absence of class, the tendency to manage, and the crude materialism that I mentioned. Uh, but it cannot do what political economy does in the way that I've outlined it. It cannot do that. Um, it cannot organically link the social and the, and the political to the economic, and it cannot give you the rich uh, analysis uh, that one needs. It must be taken seriously and respected, but it cannot do what political economy uh, is able to do in ways that I outlined. More important, and I'll finish with this, is uh, what to do about uh, the use of Marxism as an instrument of political change and political organization. There was a time when Marxism was the standard reference point of uh, parties of the left across core countries and across developing countries. That time is gone. And it is gone for a variety of reasons. Um, that has gone together with the demise of the left as a, a serious political player uh, across the world. The two are not unrelated to each other. The abandonment of um, any kind of reference or most references to Marxism by the main parties of the left um, in Western Europe, in the United States and elsewhere, not the United States ever had it much, but anyway, in Western Europe and, and elsewhere, um, goes together with the weakness of the left and its detachment from working class um, activity and working class uh, aspirations and desires. Uh, these are connected processes. Um, if the left is to uh, re-emerge as a serious political force, it must rediscover the significance of Marxism for the here and now, along ways that I began to sketch at the high level of abstraction, which must be made more, more concrete and more specific uh, in, in the time ahead. Um, there is no other way, in my judgment, um, for the left to uh, recover its position other than to reintegrate itself within um, working class movements. And that requires elements of Marxism, consistent and coherent elements of Marxism. It cannot be done uh, in other ways, uh, in my judgment. And that is also the importance um, of continuing to debate Marxism and continue to find relevance of contemporary Marxism, uh, of Marxism for contemporary uh, uh, capitalism. That's all I had to say. I've spoken enough. So uh, thank you for attending, and I look forward to the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Costas. 
Um, we are about to start Q and A session. So let me just say something quickly first. In the introduction, I wanted to let everyone know that Professor Duncan Foley is also um, part of our panel today. Welcome, Duncan, and thank you so much for joining us. Hi. I would like to um, start with a question for you, but let me just first say something to um, our attendees. Please type your questions in the Q&A. Um, Juani will be reading your questions out to Costas and to the panelists. So if you want first your name to be um, mentioned, please say that in your question. Also include your affiliation if that's something you want us to mention. You are also free to ask questions to anyone in this um, in the panel. Um, just make sure you point that out before you before the question. Okay, and now my question to Professor Foley. Um, so Professor Foley, can you tell us the story of how you switched from um, neoclassical to Marxist political economy um, and, 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 and what happened there and, and, and why you decided to, to, to do that? Thank you. Oh, well, I wish that hadn't been the question actually, because it's too, I think it's too personal in a way for this setting. Um, but I, I would, uh, um, I could say a couple of things about it, and then I, I wanted to say a few things in, in response to Karsas Lavaritsa's remarks, um, and then also pose a kind of a question for people to think about, uh, maybe um, for the next few sessions of this, um, of this gathering. Um, well, I think uh, you have to understand um, that I, uh, got interested in Marxism in the 1960s in the context of the Vietnam War and the radicalization of the Vietnam War. You also have to understand that my approach to that was really different because I um, am a Quaker, and which is a pacifist religion, and um, was uh, already in considerable dissent from the mainstream national security kind of views of United States government and United States society. So um, the kind of radicalization that I underwent was uh, to understand much better uh, the role of American, uh, of, of the American government in world affairs and the way in which it was intervening. Um, but, uh, and that led me, like many people, to say, well, what is this all about? Shouldn't we find out what the real sources of this are? And one of the analytical uh, places that you go to find out sources, as Justice Lapovitsis just explained uh, in a considerable uh, degree, is to go back to Marx. Um, my first attempts to read Marx were complete failure. I could not understand it, uh, largely because I had uh, absorbed a lot of the neoclassical point of view. So I couldn't understand uh, a number of the, the general framework in which the analysis took place. And it was only a little later when I went to Stanford University and there was a group of uh, graduate students and uh, faculty, including Donald Harris and Bridget O'Loughlin, um, uh, and many others, especially the graduate students, that I got in, involved in really thinking through the Marxist question systematically. Let me, let me, um, as I say, just put a couple of footnotes on Costas's uh, uh, summary, which I admire greatly for how much he got into such a short uh, time and how well how how well he put it and. In a, in a way that I, I think was quite understandable. Um, one uh, point that I think will come up again and again as these sessions unfold is that Marxist economics also inherits from the classical political economy a characteristic idea of what you're trying to explain, and that that characteristic idea of what you're trying to explain has a strong element of a long period or a long run in it. So the classical political economists um, and Marx 
I tended to think that what you could explain analytically and with the kind of rigor that Custis uh, uh, invoked is not necessarily what happens day to day or all of the turbulence that's at the surface of capitalist society and the capitalist economy, but the uh, longer term averages to which the um, system tends to return. Um, and uh, I, I think this will come up. I think this is also related to this issue of levels of abstraction which will also come up, I'm sure, um, over and over again. And then I'd like to say uh, uh, one other methodological point, which is let's not assume, even though we're in favor of rigor and clear thinking, let's not assume that there is a right answer to every question, one right answer to every question. Um, I think it's much more in the spirit, in Marx's spirit of criticism, Marx once wrote a, uh, a piece called uh, For the Critical Criticism of Everything Existing or something like that. Um, and uh, from that point of view, uh, it's possible to, with rigor and with careful and clear thinking, to reach uh, a variety of conclusions that all make sense. And maybe our picture of reality only can be complete to the degree that we see these different uh, these different facets as like a mosaic that has to be put together to form uh, an image, uh, a, some approximate image of a whole very complex system. And finally, um, as a kind of thought exercise, um, taking the very simple, basic idea of a class divided society uh, where the two classes are capitalists on the one hand and workers on the other, and the worker's wage does not, uh, is falls short of the value of what workers produce. So there's a surplus value, which takes the form of profits, rent interest, and other, uh, other um, income streams. Um, Suppose we think about is the impact of redistribution. So suppose the state decides it wants to redistribute surplus value to workers by taxing, let's say, capitalist profits and interest in rent and using the uh, proceeds of that tax to subsidize workers either with money payments or perhaps by providing services uh, that are particularly useful education or health or whatever. What uh, does Marx's theory predict is going to be the long run effect of that? And in particular, can that kind of redistribution according to Marx's theory or under what assumptions, can it actually change the rate of exploitation and the rate of surplus value? And if not, why not? Um, or if so, why so? I'm not gonna, I'll, I'm supposed to have, come back and give a talk, I think in four weeks from today. Um, so maybe I'll let it go until then and see what people come up with in the meantime uh, for that question. Excellent, thank you so much, Professor Foley. Um, and now we will start the Q&A um, section. Hi, um, thank you so much, Duncan, and uh, thank you so much, Costas, uh, for the brilliant lecture and um, very insightful remarks. Um, so just before we begin, um, I begin to read out the questions. Just to remind you guys, the, uh, we're collecting all the questions together, and uh, I'm going to be reading out a selected few. We will do our best to answer every single one of them, but because of the time limit and given how many of you are there, uh, it will probably be hard to answer every every question. Um, so yeah, um, so we're gonna begin with the question uh, from um, Mehmet A, uh, A, who is a PhD student from Durham University. He asked, does it still make sense to give the hierarchical priority to production in the age of financialization or should it be coined as outdated? Do you want me to answer these one at a time? 
or yeah yeah okay or do you want to uh, unless i mean if, you, if there are any similar ones I'll, I'll take them together if there aren't i'll just answer them one at a time okay yeah, but you, i think you can start by this one and then the next okay, one okay, okay. No, no problem. It. it's a very good question it's a very good question it, it actually begins to to give further nuance and insight into uh, the question that Duncan asked just before, which is if, if distribution begins to change and redistribution begins to take place, and if other forms and other types of income, stream, income streams emerge, which are very, very prominent and important, how do I want to approach it? What I want to say, how do, how do the conditions change and how, how would capitalism function differently? I don't have the full answer for that, obviously, but, uh, to my mind, it, it it touches on the question that um, the broader question that Duncan sets uh, set, and uh, I look forward to his answer. Actually, four weeks from now, um, but uh, on the specific question, um, it is a very good very good one, and it's something that has troubled me for for, for some time. Um, in in several core countries, not all of them, but in several of them, we observe phenomena in which. Um, forms of income derive heavily from finance in very, very important ways and more broadly from, from um, circulation rather than uh, production. There's no question. Financialization contains that. Does this mean that we should alter um, the, fun the fundamentals of the approach? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. Um, um, because the bulk of income continues to be produced from profit flows as new flow of value. Uh, and that requires analysis of production and analysis of productive and unproductive labor, uh, who works and how, and the continuous change, changes of work and employment, the rise of different forms of employment and so on. Um, that's where the bulk of income still uh, primarily uh, arises from. Now, there might be other forms of income which are basically transfers or what I would call financial expropriation, income transfers and other forms of uh, income coming out of uh, uh, money stock rearrangements. These are very important, but I don't think they change the overall outlook. Um, and in this regard, I think the analytical order should be maintained. We should look at production in the first place uh, and how um, that gives birth to uh, to, to incomes um, in, the, in the standard way. Now, there's something else though here too, and it's this. When people talk about financialization, they implicitly assume that um, big business has somehow itself been transformed and it's become almost like a banker, or almost like a financier or something like that and makes profits out of non-productive purposes. That's not the case empirically. Uh, big businesses are financialized, but that doesn't mean that they make them profits out of financial activities primarily. It, it, it is a mistake to think that it's actually a post-Keynesian way of thinking about it. It is to think that, it is to imagine that financialization is about financial capital taking over industrial capital. That's not what's happening. Financialization of industrial capital doesn't mean that financial considerations are very important for big business, but big business makes its profit out of production uh, fundamentally. It is just that it's become, it's become more involved in financial activities, partly because of how investment has changed. So um, uh, in this regard too, one starts with production. Again. One looks at how the productive side uh, 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 operates and then develops the analysis with sensitivity and understands the transformations brought, brought about by finance and financialization. Thank you, Costas. And I think Duncan wants to add something. Please feel free. I hope not more than a footnote or a caboose to the train. The, um, uh, another, way to, another way to put this is that the financial uh, profits are derivative. Well, and a, a way to see this is that at the level of the capital system as a whole, uh, this is one of the big insights that Marx had, and I think something we want to keep in the center of our, of our attention as much as possible, is that the ultimate source of profits is unpaid labor, unpaid productive labor. That's where it is. 
that it's productive labor. It's not, uh, there's no other source of profits. There's no other source of surplus value. Uh, what people often, I think, get confused about is the distinction between the production of a surplus value and the extraction of unpaid labor on the one hand, and the realization of surplus value through competition or through a variety of mechanisms such as financialization and uh, uh, advertising or the business models of uh, companies like Google or um, Facebook and so forth. Um, so what's novel about this period is not the source of surplus value in the exploitation of labor. What, if there is anything novel, it's actually maybe not as novel as it looks, are the modes of realization uh, of the surplus value. Thank you very much both. Um, so we now have um, our last two questions. Um, so the first one is from Luciano uh, Media Peroni, excuse my pronunciations. Um, so they asked, as an economist working outside academia, for example, at a bank or an international organization, how could I use political economy in my work? Could you give a concrete example of how it could be more useful than neoclassical economics to solve a specific problem. And the second question comes from Sarah Stevano at SOAS. Um, she asked a couple of questions. First, where should current economic students begin to achieve an advanced understanding of the political, social, historical, customary alongside the economic, given that multidisciplinary training is largely missing from economics programs? And the second question from Sarah is, is the macro slash micro divide in any way useful from a Marxist political economy lens, or is it unhelpful and perhaps counterproductive altogether? Okay. Um, first question also gives me an opportunity to say something about Duncan's uh, first point closely related. Um, it depends on what you ask, right? What you want economics to do. I think Solo wrote something very interesting once um, I read some time ago. Um, if you want to explain the fluctuations, I don't know, in the price of coffee or in the price of beer in, the, in, in Brooklyn next week, you wouldn't really use Marxist political economy particularly. You would go and discuss demand and supply analytics. You would probably engage in some kind of uh, standard neoclassical theory. Marxism, Marxism can also use these things for day-to-day for -day analytics. So I wouldn't, um, you know, if that's what you want to do, if you want to explain how the price of beer moves or what the tax um, transformation, of, uh, change of tax rates would do to price and so on, um, you could use techniques that would be fairly similar to those of um, neoclassical economists. They wouldn't be much different. That's different there. If you want to discuss broader issues at work, however, if you work for a bank and if you're planning uh, investment strategies, if you're considering country risk, if you're looking at how uh, the financial system of a particular country, uh, the implications it has for the investment decisions of uh, um, particular um, particular lenders and so on. I know I'm using an example which isn't the best in this audience, but it is an example that comes up at work. Then obviously political economy is very useful and actually in practice used. They might not call it Marxist political economy, but that's how they do it. I know from my students, several of whom have ended up at banks, and that's how they do it. And the reason why, the reason why banks would have them uh, is because they can do that kind of work, uh, usually uh, better than than a straight uh, graduate of a straight neoclassical um, uh, uh, course, a straight neoclassical program. So um, it depends on what you're asking, right? And it depends on how you're approaching, which is also why I said neoclassical econ economics from a Marxist perspective must be taken seriously and not rejected out of hand, right? It, it is the wrong approach to, to take. One must command it and understand it uh, and, and, and see uh, what happens, even if one disagrees with it. Um, so that's what I would um, say on the first question. On the other two questions, um, how do students acquire this knowledge? Well, 
I mean, we all know what's happened to universities and we all know what's happened to uh, Marxism uh, as an intellectual pursuit in the last uh, several uh, decades. Uh, Anglo-Saxon universities actually in many ways are still better than, than other places in Western Europe, not so good as other places in, in developing countries where Marxism does retain some residual influence. Um, but what we've observed is um, a gradual process of exclusion of Marxist political economy from economics departments across the world. And the, one of the most egregious cases I know, because I was there to see it, was at the University of Tokyo in Japan, which uh, was dominated by Marxist political economies, economists when Japan was a successful country, right? When Japan had, when Japan had, uh, had, uh, had rapidly growing capitalism. Not that this explained it, not that they Marxists did it, but uh, but that's a fact, right? The, the main the main department of economics of the country was dominated, populated by very powerful Marxist political economies, while Japan was doing well. When Japan began to do worse, then the main economics department of the country and several others became heavily populated by neoclassical economists, and the Marxists were uh, excluded from it. Um, uh, in the usual way. Um, how, so how do you deal with it? I, there is no easy answer and there is no royal road. What we're doing here and what we're beginning to do is an important way of providing students with precisely this broader framework that they need um, and other people with this broader framework that they need in order to continue and maintain um, that kind of uh, approach, which is so important uh, today. As for micro and micro, macro and micro division, as you know, there is no division of this type, strictly speaking, within Marxist political economy, but in practice, it is there. The circuit of capital that I mentioned can be used to discuss a particular enterprise, and it can also be used to discuss the economy as a whole. One has to adjust the concepts when one does that, but the framework is, is, is capable of handling both the micro and the macro dimension. Um, but the micro aspects would have to be more focused on the power relations between the employer and the employee and so on. They would have to bring the, these dimensions in, uh, which are very, uh, very important. So it is there after a fashion, but not in the very formal um, uh, way, in the very formal division that the neoclassical economics uh, engages in. One last thing on this, even within neoclassical economics in the last few years, it's interesting to observe the distinction and the division between the two has become more blurred than it used to be. Um, in effect, all economics has become micro and, uh, and macro is increasingly becoming micro. Um, what this would mean for economics is not good, you know, classical economics, because macro has its own considerations. Um, but that's important, I think, uh, to observe. For us anyways, in Marxist political economy, the, the, the distinction must be approached with great caution. Uh, it's there, but uh, not as in the same in the same way to neoclassicals. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, the next questions. Uh, I think one may be po uh, potentially already answered to an extent, but um, Jan Jan Frone asked, um, Costas talked about the Marxist conception of money as expressing the value of the commodity base. How can this be brought in line with the empirical reality of money creation, quote unquote, out of thin air, without a likewise expansion in commodities or abstract labor, for example, uh, QE or private bank money creation? And then another question uh, from anonymous person is, how a progressive government can use Marxist political economy uh, to run the state? Is it useful for designing fiscal and monetary policy? Yeah. Um, on the first question, which is analytically complex and difficult, um, yes, it can be done. There's, not, uh, there's no um, difficulty um, per se. Um, but the difficulty of shifting away from a money that has a commodity form created by commodities and is a commodity form to a money that doesn't have a commodity form and is created in through institutions mostly dominated, credit institutions mostly dominated by the state at the center, um, 
is a matter of pursuing the analysis through different levels of abstraction. Uh, it, it cannot be done in three minutes, but it is possible uh, starting from uh, the foundations and proceeding. There is no, no uh, uh, insuperable difficulty here in moving away from money that has value of its own and is a commodity money to a money that doesn't have value of its own and is a non-commodity money, potentially a credit money or a credit and fiat money. There is no insuperable difficulty. There are diff diff differences in how these monies operate, differences in the impact they have on the economy and the effects they have on accumulation, of course. The monetary regime matters. Um, but there is no analytical and logical difficulty. The difficulty often arises here because people who read Marx and Marxist theory, especially all this stuff, tend to think that if money is not a commodity, then uh, not obviously a commodity, then somehow the entire structure of the labor theory of value is in that. Uh, and it becomes highly problematic. That's a very, very misleading and that's, that's the wrong reading there. That's not what, that's not what it's the case. Marx at times, it's true, um, exaggerates the importance of gold, it's true. There are occasions in which he, he leads you to think that this is, cannot be done otherwise, uh, particularly the, the global, the world uh, level. But more careful reading of Marx um, shows that this isn't the case, uh, that it is perfectly possible to start with his analysis, which is actually a fundamental economic analysis and move on to other forms of money. And it is a, it's a question of employing the, the, the methodology that I outlined. It has to be done in this methodical way, traversing the levels of abstraction um, and going from one to the next. Money today is basically credit money produced privately um, and state uh, supported fiat money produced through a central bank. Um, we have theories whereby we can understand how it works. We can rely on, um, on classical political economy and on what followed classical political economy and the work of the 20th century and so on. So that's not really an insuperable problem um, here. Now, of greater interest here is um, how to use Marxism for a, by a progressive government. Well, let me tell you a story about this in which I was involved myself personally. Um, 10 years ago, Greece hit the skids. The country, um, the country uh, was bankrupt and, um, and um, effectively bankrupt and uh, on a program because uh, the international financial markets were shut it out. So um, it would have been formally bankrupt if, uh, if things had not happened in terms of uh, the so-called partners in the European Union. Um, how to approach that? What to say about that from the perspective of the left, from the perspective of a progressive government? And a progressive government presumably was formed in 2015, right? A series of government that was supposed to be a progressive government. So how to use Marxism? Well, I hasten to add that Syriza didn't use Marxism. He might have talked a lot about it. <laughs> there might have been people who talked a lot about it. Anyway, didn't use it. Um, what was used was a mishmash of... Uh, sort of radicalism of the time, a little bit of Keynesianism, um, and so on. Um, Marxism was very important, in my judgment, for a number of reasons. First of all, it allowed you to understand the importance of money in, the, in that situation, the importance of the euro, right? It allowed you to understand the importance of the euro, and it allowed you to understand that this form of money in which Greece had participated, uh, which was basically an inconvertible money created by central bank and then, allow, then used as a base for credit money creation by private banks. This form of money created a structure within which it became very difficult, almost impossible for a progressive government to adopt progressive policy, policies. If you understood that from Marxist political economy, then it became immediately obvious that if you were, if you were going to follow radical policies, you had to break with that, whole, with that kind of money. Right. This was a political decision. It didn't, it was a very difficult political decision, but Marxist political economy left little doubt. There is no radical policy without breaking with the Euro. It's impossible because the institutional structures of the Euro and the way in which the Euro worked um, made radical policies impossible while you 
if you did abide by the uh, by the rules of the euro. That was a clear conclusion, and uh, Syriza refused to see it, and so did the majority of um, the Greek left, because they were too scared. Because obviously breaking with that was a big thing, and they were too scared to admit it. They they tried to find all kinds of other ways in which they could somehow have radical policies without getting out of the euro. In the end, it became obviously it's impossible, and they surrendered. Um, so Marx's political economy was very important uh, in this regard. It was also very important because he began to tell you, if you then decide to go for radical policies by breaking with the euro, certain things will follow. You'd have to certain you'd have to do certain things in terms of progressive policies. You'd have to nationalize the banks. You'd have to intervene in production. You'd have to impose capital controls. You'd have to support workers' incomes. You'd have to take care of how inflation would unfold. All that followed naturally from um, the analytics of how important uh, the euro was. You'd also have to default on the debt, on the national debt. Otherwise, it would have been impossible to get out of, the, of that um, framework. Uh, Marxism was very important. It didn't tell you specifically what you had to do. You had, you, you'd, have to, you'd have to mobilize other theories at every instance. It didn't tell you what would happen on Monday morning. Right, if you decided to do that, you'd have to mobilize other theories for that. Marxism is not the key that opens all doors, but it, it told you what the framework is within which you'd move. And he had he left no doubt about that. And the reason ultimately why um, the radical government of Syriza failed was obviously the fundamental reason was political cowardice. But, uh, but in terms of uh, analytics, it's because Marxism was not used. And you've got people like Yanis Varoufakis arguing that somehow you could remain in the Euro and be radical. I mean, which made no sense. Um, so yes, Marxist political economy is of paramount importance for policies as well, for practical policies, not just not just uh, not just theoretical critique of capitalism. Thank you very much, Costas. Um, Duncan, do you want to add anything? Uh, actually, I, I I think Costas uh, covered the territory very well. I guess on this, I guess I have just a couple of sentences. Look, if you want to broaden out your education, uh, don't hang around the economics department so much. Hang around with the anthropologists and the sociologists and the political scientists, especially if you can find some of them who are uh, kind of agree with you about or have some basis of agreement on political uh, things. And uh, maybe audit some of them breathtaking idea, audit some of their courses and see what they have to say. Um, and I agree with uh, uh, Costas very much. Um, I guess I would boil it down to advice to a progressive government is always check, if you want to really get something out of Marxism, always check back to the class question. So think through your policies in terms of which classes or which fractions of which classes are going to react, how they're going to react. Um, and I think you, that at least gives you a little better orientation towards uh, what's going to happen. That's great, thank you. Uh, I think we now have time for the last uh, set of questions. Uh, we have we've received so many great questions, but due to the time limits, um, we can only do um, two more, I think. So uh, the first one comes from Patrick Leeds. Um, given the importance for the broader left, uh, how do these important discussions reach and contribute to building left organizations, popularizing without losing rigor? And uh, another question comes from Charlie April. Um, how many Marxist political economy uh, be used, uh, sorry, how may Marxist political economy be useful as a tool for contemporary trade unions, for example, as a tactical or agitational tool? Can you just repeat the first question? The second I got more clearly, but can you just repeat the first question, please? Sure. Uh, the first question was, given the importance for the broader left, how do these important discussions reach and contribute to building left organizations, uh, popularizing without losing rigor? 
that is the most difficult question here, right? How to how to how to make Marxism and Marxist political economy a live political instrument again? As I said uh, at the end of my talk, uh, the left has been cut off from the working class, and it's not a serious political force really anymore, independently at any rate. Nothing comparable to what used to be the case 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Um, and one reason why it's been cut off from the working class, not the only reason by any stretch of the imagination, but one important reason is because the left has basically detached itself from Marxism. Certainly the big parties of the left have detached themselves from Marxism. Marxism is a, has always been a very important instrument here. Um, it is what transformed the left into such a powerful presence in the 20th um, century. Um, the question then is how do you do it um, Again, and that is not an easy process and it's not gonna happen uh, overnight, for sure. That is a process that took a long time in the 19th century, it took a long time by the Germans, it was the Germans who did it, the German Social Democrats who did it primarily, and others, but primarily the Germans. Um, it was Engels and a variety of other people who were very talented, very powerful, and they actively transformed uh, German social democracy into uh, an instrument of policy, uh, politics that was heavily influenced by Marxism in the conditions of Germany at the time. It fitted the conditions of rapidly industrializing Germany um, in which the working class had been moved into big cities, uh, difficulty making ends meet and, and, and oppression and exploitation, Marxism made sense. Things have changed dramatically, obviously, in the years since then. Marxism has been cut off but we do have enormous social tensions today, enormous social tensions and enormous inequality uh, phenomena and enormous uh, crisis phenomena. Capitalism, global capitalism at the moment is an interregnum. Clearly the situation that has prevailed over the last few decades, financialization and so on, is, is coming to, the, to an end. It, it cannot continue. American hegemony is also um, seriously challenged. Uh, unipolar, the unipolar world is coming to an end. Um, so in that condition, in those, in those situations, social, political, and geopolitical, um, Marxism is of paramount importance, paramount importance, if the left is to acquire an independent voice. As long as it keeps away from Marxism, it will find it very difficult to have an independent voice. Everybody says, for instance, in the current situation in which nuclear war has become an issue, suddenly, where is the left? And it is very difficult to see it. Where is the left as a separate voice, as an independent voice? The most you get from the left is, 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 a, is a pay limitation of liberalism. Some kind of liberalism, the, the liberal view is dressed as left view. It's not an independent left position. Well, it won't be easy to do it unless the left rediscovers some elements of Marxism uh, and begins to understand the world in the classic Marxist way or for the present conditions, obviously. Um, it's not easy to do. It's a very difficult thing to do. You should have no illusions about it. It will take events and it will take sustained effort by uh, political activists and, and others. In this regard, the language spoken by Marxists is of great importance. We all, we all know what this means. Marxists, Marxists, particularly political activists, have learned to speak a language which they only themselves understand. It's almost, it's a, it's a kind of patois. It's a, it's a, it's a very strange um, lingo which allows people to communicate and the majority of humanity doesn't get. So it is very, very important to rediscover plain language uh, in which the concepts can be translated and they would mean something to working people. Very, very important. Now in that situation, in relation to the second question, the trade unions, we've been doing some work here in Britain uh, on this so I can answer with some um, direct experience. A burning issue is the cost of living crisis. A burning is social issue. I mean, it's a real crisis in Britain. You have real poverty and people who can't make ends meet. People at work, not people outside work. We're not talking marginalists in that case. We're talking people at work who can't make ends meet because of the absolute disaster that the Tory government has made and because of the, because of the terrible situation state of British capitalism anyway. Um, trade unions uh, are becoming active again, uh, very strongly active. And there's a strong trade union um, um, uh, readiness to, 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 to intervene. How can Marxism be useful? It can explain the cost of living crisis in very straightforward and simple terms. It can bring out the issues of class 
uh, it can discuss profits and explain that the problem is profits, not wages. It can, it can easily explain to trade unions and give trade unions arguments about how to tackle inflation uh, without, uh, by, by, by constraining profits and by uh, intervening in production and, and doing things about uh, supply, uh, not demand. It can do that. And it is very, very important that it does that in plain language that trade unions can understand and that they can use in action. Um, not an easy task, uh, but it can be done. And some of us are trying it. What will happen, <laughs> how it will work out, watch this space. I mean, it's not gonna be fast and it's not gonna be massive, but um, you, the possibilities are there. Thank you very much. Um, did you want to add anything, Duncan? No, no, that I think uh, Costas uh, put it very well. <laughs> Okay, um, it looks like we have a couple of more uh, minutes. So maybe let's, um, let's add uh, two more questions. Uh, there's a question from Leila. How can Marxist political economy and the Keynesian analysis of markets work together? And how can Marxist analysis can be relevant when we have so many breakthroughs in other areas like sociology, political economy, and philosophical criticism of Marxist methodology. And another question from Yanis, uh, one of our uh, student organizers from New School, asked, um, mainstream economics have progressed with their own notion of political economy, quote unquote. Several courses of uh, quote, political economy, unquote, are being taught in mainstream universities, while a number of public intellectuals proclaim to adopt a quote, political economy analysis, unquote, of contemporary phenomena. How is this notion of political economy different to the one discussed? And why does this difference matter for social analysis and transformation? Well, I can start with the last one. And as I said, I mean, you can do it in different ways. You can call it, you can do international political economy. You can start with economics and bring in politics and call that political economy too. You can do these things. Uh, and they're done. They're done partly because people realize that there are limits to what neoclassicism can do, limits to the questions it can answer. And people want to answer the bigger questions and therefore they are obliged to do that. But the point is they, that is not done in the way that organically links uh, the aspects that I mentioned, that actually integrally allows you to account for the economic and the non-economic, the market and the non-market and richly analyze the interrelationship between the two. Um, the most developed political economy we've got in this respect is the Marxist political economy. Other political economies uh, can tell you things for sure, but you're always left looking for the underlying relationships, for the, for the, for the more rooted relationships uh, when, you, when you read that kind of account. Marxist political economy, if it's done um, to a good level, um, begins to answer that, begins to give answers to that. And that's because of how of its structure. I mean, that's because of its roots, the philosophical foundations and the stuff that I mentioned before, which other traditions in political economy don't have. Um, that is its strength in my judgment. Um, that's how it should be developed. Now, as for um, criticisms and critiques, what can I say? Um, when is the last time Marxism was accepted without criticism? Well, I mean, from the moment it arrived and it emerged, it, it became <laughs> subject to withering critique. And I'm not, you know, I, my, I myself would find certain things, I mentioned some of the things which are not clear, which would not work. Uh, I've devoted my life to it, but I can still see that, uh, well, yeah, certain things don't work as well as I would have liked. Um, but so what? I mean, which tradition? How? I mean, think about it. What is Marxist political economy today? It's just a minority pursuit, right? People who do it uh, uh, are few and far between. It used to be far more, but are few and far between. And it's not an easy option. There was a time back in the 1910s and 1900s that the best and brightest of, the, of that generation in Europe chose Marxism. Um, it's no longer the case. Um, 
so it is a minority pursuit under, under difficult conditions. It is very popular, far more popular in other social science, sciences and other humani in humanities rather than in economics. And there are good reasons for that. Um, and that also produces very interesting outcomes. And if people wish to broaden out their approach, they should read these works. I read anthropology myself, I read sociology all the time. Um, but that's what it is. I mean, it's not, it's not a closed book. It's not a finished product. It's a, it's a work in progress, just like Marx left it. Um, and it is for us to, to make it relevant for the current conditions and to make it, um, uh, to make it respond to the current conditions. It is something that's ahead of us. It's a challenge. It's not the key that we've got that opens all doors. Um, well, just to, uh, on this political economy question, look closely at the at the different qualities of work that are coming out of these uh, different types of political economy. When I read it, I almost always think that the most fruitful ones or the most insightful ones actually have a pretty good. Uh, a dollop of Marx's thinking somewhere in the in the construction of the argument. I mean, this was very cl very clear in the case of somebody like Joseph Schumpeter, who, in an earlier generation, um, tried to modernize and bourgeoisify, in a certain sense, the Marxist insights. Um, but that, but you get Francis, somebody like Francis Fukuyama. You can't have Francis Fukuyama without Marx. That doesn't make any sense. Where did he, where did he start thinking about uh, talking at that level? I do think that this also touches on Costas's very important point about language. That what you're getting a lot in these political economy programs is. Uh, translation of Marxist insights into language that's more acceptable and uh, less polarizing, as it were. So, but I, I, you know, we're all talking about the same world. If you're going to really seriously talk about political economy, you're going to talk about class and you're going to talk about surplus value and you're going to talk about exploitation. Costas, would you like to jump in? This is our last question. So if we can do a bit of back and forth and then we will um, wrap up. No, I don't. I mean, I've pretty much said what I, um, what I had to say. I don't want to repeat myself. Um, yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, well, if, if no one else has any additional points to add, not that we need any, I think we covered um, pretty amazing grounds today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Lapovitsas. Thank you, Professor Duncan. Thank you to the committee. Most importantly, thank you to everyone that registered. Um, apologies for the hiccups in the beginning. Um, in two weeks from now, all of that will be sorted. We will send out an email reminder. We will send out an email with housekeeping. We will send out an email with the reading list for our sec um, following lecture. So please um, keep an eye out. Um, and add us, add, um, subscribe to the channel, make sure you add our email to your list so they don't go to spam. Um, I think this will be it for today. Thank you so much and see you all next time. Oh, Juanhi, please jump oh, in. Just to remind you, uh, next lecture is on Tuesday. So all of our lectures will be on Mondays, except for the next one by Richard, uh, Professor Richard Wolf, and then the, the fourth lecture by uh, Professor Anwar Shaikh. So it's Tuesday, the same time. So see you in two weeks time. Thank you very much.